You're listening to This Week in Chiropractic. Here are the headlines for the week of February 2nd, 2021. The Texas Chiropractic Association announced a victory over the Texas Medical Association. The Supreme Court of Texas has ruled that the chiropractic scope of practice can include the musculoskeletal system, subluxation complex, and VONT. This brings an end to a 10-year battle between the associations, which hinged on the claim that neurological conditions were outside of the scope of practice. The full court opinion can be found in the show notes. Chiropractic economics projects decreased enrollment in chiropractic school during and after the pandemic. Data from the Chronicle of Higher Education show that more than a third of students are reconsidering enrolling in college due to the COVID pandemic. The number of chiropractors recommending chiropractic school to potential students has steadily declined over the past three years that ChiroEco has conducted their schools survey. In research, a paper published in Chiropractic and Manual Therapies last week evaluated the adherence to radiographic guidelines for low back pain in two Canadian provinces. Half of the 53 participants stated they were aware of current radiographic guideline recommendations, and one quarter of the participants indicated that they did not use guidelines to inform clinical decisions. From the conclusions, a small proportion still hold beliefs about radiographs for low back pain that are discordant with current radiographic guidelines, but the adherence rate to radiographic guidelines measured 75% using clinical vignettes. And the World Federation of Chiropractic has announced new members of their research committee. The appointments come months after the resignation of multiple members of the research committee last year. In their press release, the WFC states that the new research committee reflects the WFC's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion and is widely representative of geographic regions, culture and ethnicity, research background, and specialty interests. The new committee consists of 13 members from seven countries, and all but one holds a PhD. Professor Christine Gertz continues as the chair. And those are your headlines for February 2nd, 2021. You can get links to all of these news articles, research articles, and topics by going to the Twitch page at exploringchiropractic.com. So again, some just a quiet couple of weeks here, um, but the COVID news continues, and this one from Cairo Eco is kind of interesting and not terribly surprising. I think they're projecting, they're kind of extrapolating here. This data comes from the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a website that does publishes a lot of survey research, um, you know, they, they look at universities, mainly undergraduate universities across the country and around the world, um, but they look at trends and, and publish um, some materials for professors and, uh, you know, adjunct faculty to use. I've used some of it. It's quite expensive, actually, which is surprising. Um, but a lot of this is data about undergraduate school. So, 33% of students overall at universities are now reconsidering enrolling in college due to the COVID pandemic. I'm not sure how that works. If they're already at university, why are they reconsidering enrolling unless they're just going to drop out? Approximately 43% of students are putting off starting one and two year programs, while 66% of students are now considering different careers, according to the study, The Pandemic's Impact on Higher Education Marketing in 2020. A lot of this has to do with tuition battles, and so you've probably heard the stories of uh, of universities still charging tuition, even though students were not going to school, were not on campus, um, or maybe weren't even taking their classes. Um, it, And so uh, the Chronicle has noted that COVID-19 touched off a financial wildfire for colleges, fanned by short-term losses and expenses, but fueled by the fundamental fiscal precarities that many institutions have been facing or failing to face for some time. Uh, Just 
obviously uh, school has become very difficult, especially higher ed, and especially for chiropractic. Um, I'll talk next week about a paper that I just saw today that did an overview of how chiropractic schools have been adjusting and adapting to teach manual therapies. But the chiropractic economics um, article continues to talk about a survey they've been doing for three years in which more than 500 chiropractors respond to a series of questions about chiropractic school. Uh, They ask things like, would you recommend chiropractic to a potential student? Would you recommend the school that you went to? And I've found this in this information pretty interesting for a while now. Um, It's gone down steadily from 80% in 2018, 2019, uh, down to 77% now uh, of chiropractors would recommend the profession to others. What is really surprising to me is the number of chiropractors who would recommend another school. So they recommend the profession, but they recommend going to a different school than they went to. 81% in in 2021 would recommend a different school. That just makes me think that people are not happy with the universities that they go to, with the chiropractic colleges that they go to. And I I feel the same way. I I spent 10 years deciding which school to go to. And, uh, you know, I was very confident that this was the school I wanted to. And I was disappointed. I don't think it's the schools. I think it's the chiropractic education in general. Uh, I think it's It needs an overhaul. It needs some improvement. We certainly need residencies. We certainly need uh, better uh, uh, training on manual therapy, on on manipulation, the adjustment, whatever. I'm reading um, Leonard Fay's book on the chiropractic odyssey and, of course, the founder of motion palpation. And he talks about this. He talks about the lack of evidence-based training on psychomotor skills and the manipulation, especially reviewing things, uh, orthopedic tests, special tests are the same in my opinion. So 80% of chiropractors would say, yeah, do chiro- of those who say do chiropractic would say, but go to a school that I didn't go to. I, I, I'd probably recommend CMCC or, you know, I'd strongly consider schools like New York and, uh, and possibly even Palmer. Um, Interesting to read through this of some of the statements, um, (laughs) things that you've certainly heard before. The profession eats itself, never unified, never growing and expanding its scope of practice. Uh, This person recommended to to embrace functional medicine. Um, Others say the ability to opt out of Medicare has not been addressed. Uh, Terrible student debt to income, no business classes, future of regulation are concerns. I recently got a a survey from my alma mater from Western States, which included a bunch of these questions, you know, uh, kind of what range are you earning? How's the how's the uh, practice going um reflecting back on your education what would you change and what was so interesting to me is that they had a question saying what classes other than business should be offered a, a complete admission that they do not teach sufficient business classes so interesting article from chiropractic economics um uh, they say, you know, it's not just education, but all of chiropractic is uh, having some issues and that it's not just from COVID as well. The Texas Chiropractic Association has declared victory against the Texas Chiropractic or Texas Medical Association. So this is a, a, a lawsuit that's been ongoing. My understanding is the crux of it is that the medical board or the medical association in texas has said chiropractors claim to treat neurological conditions and they shouldn't right the medical uh, association is saying that is not chiropractic practice they should only be doing musculoskeletal it even hinges around the subluxation complex which is in uh i believe is in the texas chiropractic board rules and 
and then VONT, and I, I don't remember what VONT is. I believe it's one of the, you know, uh, common to the functional neurology treatments, but I might be mistaken. So please drop a message, drop a comment below this video if that's something you're familiar with. Um, I think this is has a lot in common with you know the war on chiropractic with the contain and eliminate uh, the Wilkes trial back in the 60s 70s. Um, I think this uh, it's a victory. You know I I don't know I worry about um, defining things like subluxation complex, uh, but in, you know in the end the Supreme Court ruled that. The challenge rules, the rules that the medical association were challenging in Texas, read in context, do not exceed the statutory scope of chiropractic practice. The fear here was that this would take away the ability of chiropractors to do basic uh, things that are basic to chiropractic, treating sciatica, radicular pain. That is neurological, even though it stems from a physical bio biomechanical uh, issue, but to then but it would then limit their scope even beyond the so-called neurological um, conditions. So I think this is a, a good win. Um, I worry that it's going to be, uh, you know, taken out of context. But, and I, I I would assume that this is where it ends. I don't, I doubt that they go to a higher court. I mean, the Supreme Court of Texas is the highest in the state, and I don't think that this is a federal issue. So good to see that this has resolved. The entire opinion, which I have not yet read, it's 28 pages of legalese. Uh, hopefully I can read through that soon. But it is available, of course, public document. And so head to the show notes at exploringchiropractic.com to read that. The paper in the Chiropractic Manual Therapies on Adherence to Radiographic Guidelines. I chuckle because this has been such an issue lately, especially with the uh, Choosing Wisely recommendations that ACA partnered with the American uh, Board of Internal Medicine. And I just think, again, I've, t I've talked about this on different videos, there's so much misunderstanding about the role of radiographs of x-rays. And so it's interesting to see, okay, of chiropractors in Canada, in these two provinces in Canada, um, with only 69 responding, what, how many of them actually um, follow these guidelines? And I was surprised, I was, I was pleased, but then I was also a bit disappointed um, that a good amount of them are aware <laughs> of, uh, of the guidelines, Half of them are aware, uh, but one quarter indicated they did not use the guidelines to inform clinical decisions. Now, using the guidelines to inform clinical decisions doesn't mean you have to be strict and rigid about them. doesn't mean that for every low back pain patient, you will not image them for six weeks. That's not what using the guidelines means. It means that uh, you take into account the history, the presentation, uh, the patient preferences, all of that, and your clinical judgment, right? There are conditions, there are acute low back pain, which walk into the office and you think, ooh, this is, this is not just normal acute low back pain. And that's fine then. The guidelines support getting imaging in that case. Um, th these guidelines aren't blanket statements. So I think it's misunderstood, uh, which I wonder whether that's reflected in this. But I'm not surprised if if chiropractors just throw out these guidelines and recommendations say I'm not paying attention to that at all. I'm just using my own clinical judgment. That doesn't surprise me either. Um, but the adherence based on the clinical vignettes was 75%. So that I think that's, you know, if that's truly how many are adhering to the guidelines, then I think that's good. It's certainly better than the medical professionals, right? Um, so many... Uh, x-rays and MRIs that are just totally unneeded. So good paper from CMT and the World Federation. So again, I wish I knew more about, you know, the uh, what happened a few months ago. This certainly was after COVID uh, because the, the, there are a couple of 
of recommendations from the WFC Research Committee on for Chiropractors Dealing with COVID that were written by Greg Kotchuk and others who then resigned from the committee. And again, my, my understanding is that there was some concern about influence of corporate sponsors of the WFC, including perhaps a pharmaceutical. I, I might be completely wrong about that, but that's what I understand. And so it's really, you know, some great researchers that re- resigned from the committee. Now, in February, the board has appointed other members, new members to the committee. And many of these are familiar. So Christine Gertz remains as current chair. Uh, Scott Haldeman is chair emeritus. Mark andre Blanchette in Canada I'm not familiar with. It's at, uh, he's at University of Quebec at river which is the French-speaking chiropractic school in Canada, so I don't know anything about it. Dr. Mitch Haas, who used to be at Western States as the research chair there. And Jensen from Australia. Melissa Keo from Malaysia. It's awesome to see that we have uh, true representation of females and an international community of researchers. I'll note she is a PhD candidate. All but Mitch Haas have a PhD, if you consider the doctorate in philosophy, as a PhD for Ann Jensen. Uh, Imran Khan from New Zealand. Uh, Kesari Padiachi from South Africa, apologize if I'm butchering these, Steve Passmore from Canada, Katie Pullman in the U.S., Professor Sidney Rubenstein in the Netherlands, and Stacy Salisbury, who is a nurse, Master's of Nursing, has a PhD, and then Professor Michael Schneider, well-known researchers in the chiropractic world, many of whom are, are younger, a PhD candidate right now. Uh, I don't know if she's involved in in Carl, that would be interesting. But it's this is promising. Um, it, you know, it, it was nice to have perhaps bigger names. I mean, you, you think of Craig Kotchuk currently as one of the top chiropractic researchers, I guess. Uh, so a lot of these I'm not familiar with by name, uh, but they are a bit younger, up and coming researchers. And so this is promising. Nearly half are, are female, probably not quite half, but at least a third, it looks like. I think that's great. I think this speaks to uh, the the addressing diversity. It speaks to uh, represent, representing different countries and different regions. So looking forward to see what comes out of this. Uh, the role of the committee is under the leadership of its chair is to advise the board on matters of science and research and provide expertise in peer review and abstract selection at the biennial congresses. So they're not necessarily doing research for the WFC. They're not necessarily making statements or guidelines, um, but they play an important role. So that is it for um, for this week in chiropractic. Again, these notes, these links to these articles, and a couple comments are available at exploringchiropractic.com. Look for the Twitch page. Um, that's T W I C H. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm on TikTok, I'm on LinkedIn, um, all of those at Exploring Chiropractic, except for LinkedIn, which is just my name, Nathan Cashin. I'm the host of the Exploring Chiropractic podcast, which is hoping to get back up and running pretty soon. And I will see you again next week for more of Next Week in Chiropractic. Chiropractic.